Hello and welcome to this podcast from Blackwell Online. My name is George Miller, and my guest today is John Sutherland, who is Emeritus Professor of English Literature at University College London. A Victorian literature specialist and former chair of judges for the Booker Prize, John is perhaps best known for his series of literary puzzle books, which began with Is Heathcliff a Murderer? His latest book is called simply Curiosities of Literature, and explores everything from what happened or didn't on Thomas and Jane Carlyle's wedding night to the posthumous fate of Thomas Hardy's brain, from writers and their bodily ailments to their favourite writing instruments. You'll discover which author was the first in history to be given a £10,000 advance, and which summer holiday proved to be the most productive in English literature, and much else besides, all told with inimitable verve and a dry sense of humour. When I spoke to John Sutherland on the phone, I began by remarking that the literary miscellany was a genre with a pedigree. Yeah, I think, in fact, one's you know, reading is, is a very random activity itself sometimes. There is a kind of, not just a pedigree for the uh, miscellany, or the kind of, you know, what, what do the French call it? Um, Autour de mon chapeau, you know, writing around my hat. But also uh, one of curiosities. I mean, you know, it's a very strange thing. Literature has lots of, uh, lots of odd nooks and crannies. And, um, you know, so uh, I think it just, you know, adds a slight kind of counter pressure to the academization of um, literature, that's to say, you know, it's takeover by the, you know, by the universities in some sense. Which is, you know, what was it Matthew Arnold said, high seriousness? Um, I think there's also a place for low triviality as well. <laughs> I think literature should run the whole sort of, uh, the whole range. But what, what I liked about your book was not only do you avoid the sort of, um, the sort of po-faced academicism, but at the same time you, you also have clearly not produced one of those books which is simply a culling from the internet. I mean, you can sense in your book the, the, the curiosity which animates you and directs you to, to really investigate questions for yourself. Yeah, I mean, you, you're very tactfully um, making the point that I'm not in the first flush of youth, and you know, all of us have got a kind of uh, attic in our heads which is full of junk. You know, things which you can't use, you know, but which you can't get rid of, you know, it's kind of, um, the kind of, you know, like, like the sleigh, sleigh, like the sled in um, uh, Citizen Kane. Mm. And so, to some extent, it, it is, you know, the kind of the, you know, the lumber of a, uh, a reading career. I've been, I've been very lucky. I, I, you know, I spent, spent my, my working life being paid to do what most people like to do, you know, for entertainment, which is to read the best literature and, most amusing literature that there is. And so this, to some extent, is a, is, is a kind of sweeping from that floor. I, I like the other metaphor you used in the introduction. You said that the, the book was arranged in sections like little stew pots. Now tell me, tell me what, what you were sort of getting at there. I suppose it was really just an attempt to, you know, there's a very grand word which is used by theorists, intertextuality, you know, which suggests that when we read literature, it all runs together into you know, one great morass. You know, and uh, oh, morass is the wrong word. Perhaps you know, sort of, uh, you know, sort of some kind of primal soup, <laughs> or secondary soup. Mm. But you know, and mine is very different from yours and different from everybody else's. One of the nice things about literature is it does actually sort of, it's one of the few sort of uh, activities which, in this day and age, preserves your individuality. And so, you know, it's, it's really just an attempt to, as it gets, you know, to, to, to introduce a few condiments. It's a, it's a, it makes it sound rather grand, you know, as if I had a project, a strategy, you know, as if I was coming to put something right. I'm not. Mm. Yeah, again, one of the nice things about, uh, about literature is that um, you can indulge, you know, what uh, Samuel Johnson called loose sallies of the mind. One of the things which comes across from the book is your fascination with the materiality and the physicality of writers and the things that surround them. Now, tell me, tell me a bit about that, because lots of, the, lots of the sections of the book are about what they ate or how they felt and physically and, or how they wrote. I, I, I mean, one, one, of, one of the interests I've had uh, over the years is publishing history, because it, I don't know if it's a general sort of feeling, but when I, when I started reading, I used to think that books were were produced in the same way that Victorians thought babies were produced. You know, sort of, uh, you know they were just dropped in gooseberry bushes, mm. and then you know, booksellers picked them up. And, and I got more and more interested in the processes behind the book, I mean, contracts and and you know, sort of actually people sitting down and writing, and then the whole kind of um, arc really from mm. first thoughts to those kind of black marks on a white surface. And so it really sort of. Um, the kind of what, what, you know, the kind of materiality or the kind of interest in the physicality of, of, of books has always been important to me. And it, or, books have always been more important to me than literature. 
I'd say what you hold in your hand rather than what you hold in your head. And do you think, I mean, why do you think the Victorians hold a particular fascination for you? Is it because that, that materiality and that energy and ambition is, is most apparent? Yeah, I think I mean, sort of, uh, one tends actually to have a, a feeling about not the immediate past, but in fact the past which is just over, you know, just over the horizon of one's parents. And I, I was born you know, sort of within sort of, uh, 36 years of the, um, of the Victorian era. And you take away 36 years from 2009, it takes you back to 1970. So to some extent, there was an awful lot of that vibrancy of, you know, of Victorian England Still around when I was growing mm. up. I mean, blacksmiths, blacksmith shops, and blacksmiths sort of uh, uh, forges, and various other things. You know, cobble streets. And, well, not cobble streets. In fact, um, wooden, wooden streets that mm. um, uh, you know, tar soaked. Sort of, they're all taken up and used for fuel during the war. So, I mean, to some extent, it's, it's really an attempt to stabilise. You know, sort of you know, kind of whole range of sort of historical change. And as I say, sort of, Victorian England was. was still with a very, very kind of real afterlife when, you know, I started reading. And also, of course, there were an awful lot of second-hand bookshops with Victorian novels around. And uh, new books were at a premium, so you know, I did tend to read a lot of Trollope because, that, uh, you know, the latest Penguins hadn't just come out. One of the stories in the book, which is particularly poignant for anyone who does any writing, is the story of Carlyle losing the manuscript of his history of the French Revolution because he'd lent it to John Stuart Mill and one of Mill's servants had put it in the fire. Now, you weren't content just to, to retell the story. I, what I really liked about that part of the book was the fact that you kind of went beyond that and you, your curiosity was piqued by it. It's legendary, of course. I mean, it's one of the things that if you're having supper, people will sometimes bring up as, as one of the great curiosities of literature that that Carlyle, when he came down to London and embarked on his magnum opus, his history of the French Revolution, and wanted to get effectively what one would think of as an endorsement or a kind of um, a useful kind of shout line from mm. John Stuart Mill. John Stuart Mill's servant came down and saw these papers, you know, sort of littered around the the um, drawing room, where Mill presumably had been reading them by candlelight the night before, and and assumed that they were um, they were cast off paper to use for um, for kindling. I've never been very, I mean, if you look at it carefully, it seems unlikely a servant would do that. Um, on, for one thing, paper was quite a valuable commodity, and it was probably written on one side only. So they would have they would have preserved it for another thing. Of course, they used it for toilet paper, oh. and you know that would have been more valuable than than, than paper for kindling fires, and and. Yeah, there's something that um, the Marxist critic George Lukacs said, you know, when you read Tolstoy, you should always insert the surf, the invisible surf, into every scene. Mm. And so I was quite interested what it would be like to be the servant. And Mill was quite good to his servants, but the Carlyles were really beastly. I mean, there was one servant who got pregnant and and had her baby in a cupboard uh, not too far away from where the Carlyles were entertaining guests at dinner. And Jane Carlyle's Mm. response was to dismiss the servant Mm. And, and doubtless a luckless bastard as well that she'd born. And so, yeah, to some extent, he's just filling in those details. As I say, around her, what in fact are kind of very well-known legendary fact that the first first manuscript version of the French Revolution was burned, and and Carlyle rewrote it. The other rather kind of small-minded thing that Carlyle did was that um, Mill offered him quite a large sum of money, but Carlyle... First of all, rather nobly said, no, he wouldn't take it. And they decided, well, after all, perhaps I will take £100 from you <laughs> for the uncertain <laughs> that you very <laughs> Scottish. Uh, I mean, so up there in Ochtermachty or where it was, they, they, uh, they do know the value of mm. any.